Philip Enriquez here presenting the Week 8 NFL podcast. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Eric Hernandez, who is a bit quiet after this week's 49ers game. You got something to say to us? Yeah, you know, that one hurt. And I think what added uh, insult to injury was I noticed that a lot of 49er fans are starting the whole bag over their face movement. I just want to speak on that real quick because it really pissed me off. The San Francisco 49ers, you have five Super Bowls, okay? When the discussion of best quarterback, wide receiver, coach, franchise, owner, team comes up, you are always within one or two. You're one of the top quarterbacks of all time in Montana. One of the best wide receivers, not the best wide receiver in Jerry Rice. You had Bill Walsh, the innovator of the West Coast offense, and you're going to put a bag over your face? Come on, man. We're not the Cleveland Browns, not the Jacksonville Jaguars. The San Francisco 49ers show a little respect in the franchise. I know we're having tough times now, but this is still a top franchise. As a uh, rival of the Dallas Cowboys, I respect the 49ers as a franchise, so I completely understand what you're saying. But lately, it hasn't been going so smooth. You predicted a 21-31 San Francisco win, and that wasn't the case. So you can't blame some of these fans. Um, Stadium was sort of empty this weekend. I went to the Dallas game, and it could have been confused for a Dallas home game so what's your take on the games what what are we what are the 49ers doing right now it's it's about the run game I don't if if anybody that plays fantasy football and just pick a running back that's playing them and you're gonna get points if you're a team don't eat, just run the wildcat I don't care if you just picked up a guy off the streets run the ball they can't stop the run on defense and you know, I, I listen to other podcasts and they post different things. And one of the ones I like to listen to is the Better Rivals. And they break it down via, uh, through Vine, you know, play by play. And you notice running against the 49ers is you see our defensive linemen. Those are two first round picks that we've invested in Eric Armstead and DeForest Buckner. Both 6'7, both around 300 pounds. These are big men playing defensive end. And they get pushed around. And I didn't understand why until I really sat down and looked at the tape. And you notice that they think too much. The defensive scheme requires too much thinking from your D lineman. What is it, a two gap scheme? Yeah. So what it does is that let's say for example on one play that was a zone read to the or was a zone to the left. So running back takes it, he cuts back in. You can see DeForest Buckner lined up on the tackle, and he doesn't know should I take the tackle, should I jump in and get the gap in between them? He gets right. sealed off within a second. There's a cutback for I think Jaquise Rogers. He cuts it for ten yards with ease we do not have the linebacking speed to to kind of counteract that because if you have fast linebackers what you're also able to do is maybe shoot those double teams once you create a double team there's an opening and if right. you have a bowman or an armstrong you're able to get in there and maybe get the tackle we don't have that so they're just giant gashes and on offense i mean colin kaepernick will, there's very little difference between him and blaine gambert at this very point. very little uh kaepernick was 16 for 34 143 yards a TD and an INT. That's yeah. They haven't had a 200-yard passer this whole season. That's that's crazy. That's heinous. It is. Um, and but I, I agree with you. Even worse than the shape of the offense is the shape of the defense. Chiquiz Rogers ran for 154 yards, a career high, on that defense. So I don't know what's going on with the run defense. But you guys keep that up, and you guys, I, I think you guys are looking at 1-9, and nine, like you said earlier before the show. Oh, I mean, there's no doubt. We could probably go 1-15 at this rate. And as much as I hate the whole bag idea, I do support the idea of if they're not going to put a winning product on the field, you can protest by not showing them to the games. I hate that. I wish I could go. I think that we need to create that home field advantage. But, man, I, I completely understand someone not wanting to spend their hard-earned money to see this product right now. Well... It is what it is. All I know is maybe uh, Tampa Bay wanted to pay you back a little bit, if you know what I mean. It's <laughs> all yeah, that maybe. I like to you know? rub their uh, kicking dirt on a, on a man that's down. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, but moving on, uh, another game. We had the uh, Seattle Seahawks taking on the Arizona Cardinals. A 6-6 game, a 6-6 tie. Yeah. What was your take on that? You look at the game. And you look at the numbers. And what I like to do is I'll break out the stats and I'll just see what it tells me. You know, I'll see who won this. Oh, this team won because they had time of possession or penalties. And it'll tell you once you watch the game, they kind of confirm who won. When you look at the stats and you look at the breakdown, Arizona should have blown out 
Seattle. They, they should have. They were at home. They had time of possession 46 to 28. They had 23 first downs to 11 for Seattle. The Seattle offense was terrible. I mean, I put them number four on this week's power rankings, and I had to stop and think, like, there's not anybody else I can put above them because that <laughs> offense is terrible. And I know it's going to improve, and so I kept them there. I know Russell Wilson's hurt. Yeah. He needs to get he needs to get healthy. Um, they're waiting for the running back to come back, Thomas Rawls. So, I mean, things can look up for them, but as of right now, that offense is terrible. Yeah, I mean, without Russell Wilson doing his magic, you know, they really – are kind of shut down because that offense, much like their defense, it's not these great playmakers on the outside or this giant yeah. offensive line like Dallas. It's a zone read, similar to San Francisco, and where they've been successful is because they've had Russell Wilson, who either knew what play to make or if he was in a bad play, he always was able to get away. Yeah, you know, defensive lineman crashing, outside linebacker crashing. He drew him. He threw a nice little seventeen-yard pass to Doug Baldwin. Bam! But right now he's limited. Yeah, and they look definitely. limited too. You could see it. Yeah, yeah, they're limited and big time. Six, six, six. I mean, and then for both kickers to miss field goals, oh, it, was, it was crazy. Yeah, they make they made a, they made them want to get Robert Aguayo from Tampa oh, Bay. Oh my God, they must have had him. I thought it was him. <laughs> I thought he took over as kicker for both, both teams. teams. Yeah, was, <laughs> I was like, man, I remember when you were playing football back in the day? They'd oh. have one guy play quarterback yeah, on both sides. That's it. I thought Aguayo <laughs> was kicker for both sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was crazy. Did you see Pete Carroll's reaction? On that last kick. I rewinded that reaction because it was hilarious. It was funny. That. He literally smiled and kind of was ready to celebrate. And he was like, uh, uh, He's now a walking gift, yeah. dude. He oh, really man, is. That was, a, that was classic. What's funny is you see him happy when when Arizona misses. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I just screwed them just like I did Minnesota last year in the yep. playoffs. He goes down. And you think, all right, they're going to cheat and get their way in this one. And then his kicker misses. Yeah. Uh, but also looking on the other side of the ball, Arizona – you know, Carson Palmer looks like he's struggling. I mean, if it wasn't for David Johnson, I don't know where Arizona would be. Larry Fitzgerald still makes his plays, but, uh, you know, he's not the type that he's going to take over the game anymore. He's not at that stage in his career. And this is kind of an interesting team because outside of David Johnson, I don't know if this is a particularly young or good team. Yeah. You know, you have the wide receivers are okay. Nothing to brag home. You have Fitzgerald, and that's really it. And he's up there. Oh, yeah. You know, people thought he was done a few years ago, and he's had a little bit of resurgence. But if he's all you got in a broken down Carson Palmer, how far can yeah, you get? It doesn't look good for them. It doesn't look good for either of those teams. That's true. Not right now. Um, but moving on to uh, the big game from recapping our last game here, we had the Minnesota-Philadelphia game. And, uh, man, I, I just want to say this. Sam Bradford came back down to earth. Yeah, reality kicked him in the face. It did. I, he, what, had four fumbles? Two? He lost two of them? Yes, he did. He was sacked six times? Yep. Yeah, I mean, he came down to earth and turned the ball over, and he made Minnesota look mortal. Yeah, he did. And you realize the protection is, you know, they have issues with protection. When I look at the game and I break down the stats, I mean, they, they look identical. I'll give you just a couple. Penalties, Minnesota was 7 for 56. Philly was 7 for 53. Time of possession was 32-8 for Minnesota, 27-52 for Philly. Third down conversion, 9 of 19 for Minnesota, 4 of 11. The breakdown to 47 per 36%. Yeah. And and I think what this game really, what changed this game and what made it an eagle win and look comfortable is two things. Is Minnesota's inability to capitalize on turnovers that put them automatically in the red zone. Right. You know, you had the interception that went through. Put them, I think, at the 25, 20-yard line. You got to get a touchdown on that. Yeah. What happened? Bradford throws the pick. Yeah. Then you turn around and they wins fumbles the handoff. You get it even deeper. I think they're at the 15 or the 20. You turn around and you only get three points. Yeah. And then Philly's able to counter with the special teams touchdown. And that's the game. Because everything else looks like if you break it down, it looks like an, an even game. But it's just inability to convert turnovers into touchdowns when you're in the red at zone. The key moments. Yep. And special teams. Yeah, in a close game, special teams is the third yeah. phase of the game that yep. breaks the tie. Yeah. I mean, when you look at games with great offenses and great defense and everyone's equal, if it's that you know kick return or punt return that's able to flip or even get a touchdown that just changes the outcome of the game, block punt, block field goal. I mean, when you're really close as far as talent and the way we look at you with, with the Minnesota and Philly, there's only a couple mistakes here or there. 
Yeah, and uh, on the offensive side of the ball for Philadelphia, Carson Wentz looks to, I, I, I said in my top 10 that he seems to look more and more like a rookie, rookie each week. He threw a TD, but he had two picks. Yeah, I think people are starting to get tape on him. I think he'll still be good. You know, uh, Doug Peterson's a good coach for him because, you know, he was a quarterback. He's offensive coordinator, studied under Andy Reid. He's going to put Wentz in the best position. That Minnesota defense will force you to throw some picks, especially to those yeah. linebackers. Oh, yeah. That was a I tough defense yeah. he went against. I yeah. Take nothing away from that. You know, I think on a neutral field or in Minnesota, maybe that game's a little bit different because of the crowd noise for a young quarterback. But right now, Philadelphia walks away with the win. They do. But the question is, can they walk away with the win next week when they go to Dallas and face number two team in my power rankings, the Dallas Cowboys? Now, I want to hear your thoughts being the Dallas fan. Look, the only thing that really scares me is the defensive side of the ball. Uh, Philadelphia's defense, it, it does scare me. I seen how they pressured Bradford. And my only hope is that our offensive line can hold up in the pass protection. Hopefully that's a bigger difference. Uh, than what I saw by Sam Bradford. But on the offensive side, I really don't fear them. I, I still see Wentz as a good quarterback, but he's still a, you know just a, a rookie to me. I don't see how he could take the game over and, and beat us on defense, especially the way our secondary is playing. But that defense with Fletcher Cox in the middle, like that's I, – I, again, I'm not sure how Dak – deals with pressure because i really haven't seen him pressured yeah. if it was romo I, it would be an even bigger deal because i hate the pressure up the middle romo always was able to deal with the pressure off the sides but the middle got him every time yeah so to me that's a wild card yeah and i'm really just more concerned with the pressure that philadelphia can and will bring and how dallas is going to deal with it yeah i i look at that game as kind of a toss-up i know it's in dallas i like to throw away the stats you won't hear me quote many stats because that's a game that's interdivisional. That's a rivalry game. Those games, I don't care if Dallas is 15 and 1. That one will be to Philly. I don't care if Philly's 15 and 1. That one will be to Dallas. Yeah. It doesn't even matter the talent level at times. They just know each other so well. The game's going to be, in my opinion, can Wentz get them to the red zone and can their running game convert touchdowns? What happened to Green Bay was Green Bay had all the time in the world. Right. And Rodgers would lead him down to the 2015. They couldn't run the ball. He got panicked. He threw into that secondary that is really good. Well, I mean, then that, if what you're saying does take place in the game, that makes me even more confident because I don't have a lot of confidence in a player like Ryan Matthews. I mean, he coughs up the ball a lot in the red zone. That's true. He coughed up the ball last week. Yep. I mean, he, even in his days in San Diego, the one knock on him was he doesn't protect the football. I agree. The one thing I'll say to that, as far as the running game is that Doug Peterson tries to do things with the running game. It isn't just a simple, we're going to hand off inside zone like Green Bay did with Eddie Lacy. He's going to try to go off tackle. They're going to run right. sweeps. He's going to put emphasis on creating lanes for the running game. You're right. If, if he has the ball and he fumbles, that's bad. But he's going to make sure that he's going to give them space. You know, They're yeah. going to create things for that running game. He understands the importance of a running game for a rookie and how that can help at least keep the Dallas, and it's going to sound weird how to keep the Dallas offense off the field with their running game that wants to right. keep you off. It's two offenses that want to keep the, the everyone the, off the field. Yeah, Their own defense off the, the field. field. Yeah. You know, it's going to be a close game. It is. Um, the, the thing is, too, that, that gives me a little more confidence is Des Bryant's coming back. We'll see how he meshes with Dak Prescott. He hasn't had a lot of playing time with him. He's missed the last three games. They've been winning without him, but the fact that the defense has to play you in a completely different manner, that's one less guy in the box. It's even harder to stop the run. Yes, that's true. I mean, true. either that or you're going to you're going to single say, up. exactly, you're going to single up on him and you're saying, "Hey, this is the guy that's going to beat me." And Des Bryant's beat them in the past. Yeah. And so, it, it, that's one thing I am looking forward to is to see how they play Des. Yeah. Do they still show Des the same respect that they did prior? Right. Does he still have it to demand that respect back? You yeah. Know? Yeah, I think, I mean, look, he's been healthy for weeks. I don't know why he's missed so many games. Yeah. But I think if he sees single coverage, Dak's going to hit him for a big place. Yeah, so let's get some predictions here. You got Well, look, I've been thinking about this one a lot. I'm going to say, and honestly, I was thinking about picking Philadelphia. It just mm -hmm. seems like Dallas is time to, to lose. I, I haven't seen Dak show that, you know, show – himself look like a rookie so 
you know, I, I was so close, but in the end, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm going to go Dallas 31, mm-hmm. Philadelphia 27. Oh, that sounds like a great game. And what I don't want this podcast to be is like first take with Stephen A picking just because he hates the Cowboys. Right. I don't want to be like Shannon Sharp, who's even worse in my opinion sometimes, you know, yeah. as oh, far yeah. as hating the Cowboys. You know, I don't want to do that. They are a rival. But I'm going to do it, and I'm going to pick the Philadelphia Eagles to win. I think they're going to win 27-24. And I think really? that, I think Dak – I don't think Dak throws an interception. I think he fumbles. Okay. I think you get to him, you can cause a couple fumbles. I think they get a field goal late, and I think there's a fumble at the end. Yeah, and, and, I, and you know, I, I can't argue. Dallas hasn't played well at home the last few seasons. Yeah. So it's not really a home field advantage. For I'm them. just hoping for a good game. But it's going to be a good be, game, yeah. that regardless. So yeah. we'll we'll see what you know what transpires in that game, and I'm sure we'll be recapping that one next week. Um, another subject that we wanted to hit. A couple of listeners brought it to my attention. Uh, let's talk about the AFC West. You had a question about the AFC West. You know, San Diego's reeled off two straight. Uh, I know that they're, I believe, three and four. Three and four now. And. Man, two of those losses, one to Kansas City, they were up. That's a division rival, and you were up 21 nothing. Another one to the Saints, you were up 10 in the fourth quarter. And I guess my question is, do you think they can make the playoffs? Look, anything's possible. That division is wide open. You have Oakland and Denver, both at 5-2. and two. Kansas City, 4-2, and two, right underneath them. And San Diego in last place, but only at 3-4. and four. It's a two-game difference. So it's all about who's going to win the division battles throughout the season. And to me, San Diego has a shot, but I, I, I kind of got to pull with Oakland. I, I, if you, if I had to pick a favorite right now, I'm going to go with Oakland, even over Denver. I think that offense is, is high octane offense. I know their defense is sketchy, but it's not like they don't have a couple of names, a couple of guys that can't make a play here, here and there and, you know, get the win. And I love Jack Del Rio. I, I mean, this guy, to me, yeah. I, I, he's the kind of coach I want. Yeah. You know, and look what he's done. The Raiders haven't been good for 18 years. Yeah. And they're winning. They're winning. I mean, he deserves all the props in the world. They have a good chance. The Raiders have a good chance to go 6-2. and two, where They go to Tampa. I think they'll right. win that game. They got Tampa. 6-2. 6-2. And, two. Six and, Raiders two. and then they're going to be, uh, they're going to have a head-to-head matchup against Denver, and that's going to be for first place. Yeah. When I look at San Diego's schedule, I mean, they go to Denver, yeah, that may be a loss. But then they have Tennessee, Miami, at Houston, the Bucks, at Carolina, versus Oakland, at Cleveland, win, and versus the Chiefs. And I think they have a chance to go 7-2. and two. I really do. And I think that'll put them at 10-6. Uh, and six. Ten and six. Wow, that's a big turnaround. Yeah. And I th- maybe that's not – as weird as it sounds, maybe that's not enough. Or maybe that is, but because of earlier losses – they are one of the most exciting teams, and I think on offense, they are the most fearless in this sense. Phillip Rivers doesn't care if you're the number one vaunted defense against no, the pass. He'll throw he on you. He doesn't care if you're the New England Patriots in Foxborough. He's going to throw. You know, they're an exciting team, and I kind of want them to win. I want them to win out. I, I give Phillip Rivers all the props in the world uh. based on just how, how great of a competitor he is. Yeah. I mean, the game isn't over till it's over. And, and and the season isn't over till it's over. And he's the kind of guy you want as a leader. He's the he's the anti Cam Newton in my eyes. Oh, where no. he's always gonna lead his troops into battle no matter how short handed they are. Yeah. You know, look how short handed they are. They have Keenan Allen on IR, Woodhead, Danny Woodhead went mm-hmm. to IR, and then they lost Manti Teo who was calling the signals on defense. Yep. And I could probably name a bunch of other players, but he's got young guys stepping up for him. Yeah, and to your point about Cam Newton, people like to defend Cam Newton and say, oh, he's just fiery and emotional. No, Phillip Rivers is fiery, fiery and, and emotional. emotional. That guy is because that guy wants to win, and he's a trash sucker too, but you don't yeah. see them moping. He's not moping. He's like, we'll get him. He's Screw it. He's the anti-Jay Cutler. Yeah, he is. That's and why they, those two hated each, each other. other. Yeah, And it's it's so weird because he, he's been around a team that hasn't been good. I think they're starting to turn the corner. But he's never just said, I want out or I want to leave. He's, he's no. passionate about staying in San Diego and being a Charger. 
you know definitely and and it's and i think the young players feed off of that yeah. i really do malvin gordon's having a lot better year than his rookie it, it took him a year but year. i think he's getting yeah, better he, he i think he has eight touchdowns that's tied for first in the yeah. league yeah um joey bosa has four sacks oh, in the man. last three he's, games he's worth the wait he was so he, far so good you know yeah he's helped that defense you're right they've kind of Maybe put themselves in a hole that's too far, especially with the game against Kansas City. That one, if that I think that game is going to bite, bite them, them in the ass. Yeah, I agree too. Because you, yeah, you're going into Kansas City. I thought that was a loss for them, but you're up twenty-one nothing. You need to finish that game. And we shouldn't sleep on Kansas City either. No, they're four and two. No. Jamal Charles isn't even playing. I mean, he he might no. be done, no. but yeah. they're still finding ways they're to four win. Four and two. Yeah, that's yeah. a pretty. That's probably the funnest division to watch if you're just a football fan. It is. It is. And and you know what I wanted to mention too. You know who's looking good. There's a tight end for San Diego, Hunter Henry. Oh, yeah. Love Man, him. he's making plays. Every time I turn the channel, he's making plays for Phillip Rivers, and that's mm. the kind of performances you get. If they can just stay healthy, which is a big if, then they have a bright future. Oh, definitely, definitely. Okay, so what do we want to get to next? Rants. Rants. Okay, so I have a rant. Phil has a rant. More times than not, it'll probably be rants about our teams, but we'll change it up different things you know i see a lot on twitter and i even see in the mainstream media the chip kelly hate he's a college coach i always hear this oh it's a college system it never works but no one ever explains that no one ever sits down and says it's a college offense that doesn't work because abc they just say xyz yeah. it's it's a college offense it's a college system it doesn't work but no one ever explains it so on offense very simple. It's a zone educate read. Educate us. Educate us. It's a zone read. It's something that Carolina used to get to the Super Bowl. It's something Seattle used to win the Super Bowl. On the running game, it's a zone read. All it is is that the tackle on the same side as the running back and the guard, which is probably your left tackle, left guard, they're going to crash down on the defensive tackle. The left tackle is going to go up and try to get the linebacker. They're going to let the defensive end come free, and he either takes a shot at the running back if he does, quarterback pulls and rolls. If he doesn't, he hands it off. There's a cutback, and there's always yards. It works. It's an offense that has proven to work. Okay? You have to have players that can operate it. Right. And Which he doesn't. He doesn't. I mean, you, Kaepernick, as great as Kaepernick is, what makes Russell Wilson great isn't that he's faster than Kaepernick or he's faster than even Gabbert. It's that he's shifty. He's got a little bit of quick speed, yeah. and it just slows down the defensive line that you're supposed to chase down the quarterback. Right. You know, so that running game works. And on top of that, He's altered his offense. In the Buffalo Bill loss, they were going up the middle, up the middle. They were stuffed. What does he run? Outside. He throws a sweep. He attacks the outside. Carlos Hyde gets a couple yards. They loosen it up. Bang, right back inside. So his running game isn't college. It has been used in the NFL to success. His passing game. The big thing that people complained about, Blaine Gabbert, you're missing wide open wide receivers. Well, our receivers aren't that great. We don't have right. Odell Beckham, Des Bryant, and Antonio Brown. You know, they're not these great. So how are they getting open? They're getting open because the coach is scheming a place to get them open. So you're missing open players because of the scheme. You know, and it's not this five wide receiver set. No, it's a three wide receiver set. If I were to show you and I took the jerseys off the Green Bay Packers and the San Francisco 49ers, you wouldn't say, oh, they're both college offenses. They're both pros. They look the same. Three wide receiver set. How many yeah. guys do you see running that? Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just because Chip Kelly's become an easy target. Yeah. Shows like first take, shows like undisputed. Yeah, yeah. They target Chip Kelly. I mean, they make those outlandish statements like he put uh what was the guy uh What's what was it? the receiver for the Eagles? The, oh. uh what was his name? Riley Greg Riley Cooper, Cooper. Cooper. Yeah. And oh, they put him on February Black History Month. Months. I bet Chip Kelly put him on that yeah. month. You know, that's ridiculous. Yes, I think he called I think he said that the assistant general manager of the 49ers Trent Gamble and Chip Kelly were cousins or related. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And and, and he, you know, I mean, it's just an easy target. And some of it I think he is a little bit arrogant. Maybe he does. I've listened to his press conferences, but at the end of the day, if you're just judging the scheme and not the player, the scheme will work when you get the right player. Players. The West Coast offense is the most innovative offense it's ever been. What made it great? Jerry Rice, Joe Montana. It's no coincidence they're also some of the greatest players that have ever played the game. A mechanic is only as good as the tools you give him. Thank you. Now, I've got that rant off my chest. The court is yours. As a Dallas Cowboys fan, I feel the need to address the Cowboys nation out there. I'm a little bit concerned. We're 5-1. We're having great success. We haven't had this type of success in, you know, maybe once in the last few years. And yet, 
there's a lot of infighting, and I, I don't like it. I, I was on Twitter earlier this week being attacked. I didn't call Des Bryant anything but a bit immature. He's an immature player. I'm just stating a fact. When you, you miss an MRI, right? I didn't say he was god-awful. Last week, we did our podcast. I said I wouldn't trade him for Rob Gronkowski. Yep. I think he's a productive, great NFL player that we need if we're going to make a run at the Super Bowl this year. But I was attacked. They, they told me because I called him immature that I must be listening to Skip Bayless. I must be listening to Shannon Sharp. I must know nothing. And I'm just wondering where all this vitriol comes from against our fellow Cowboys fans. Another narrative that needs to be swept away is this Dak versus Romo. I see these shirts, Team Romo, Team Dak. Why are we bashing? These, these guys are both Dallas Cowboys. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, first and foremost. Not a Dak Prescott fan and not a Tony Romo fan. Those are secondary. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. And so to me, this isn't a decision. This is a process. And we're going to put the player out there week by week that gives the Dallas Cowboys the best chance to win. We, as a fan base, should be having the time of our lives, but yet here we are going at each other, trying to prove this and that, and Dez is this, and Romo is this, and Dak is this, and Zeke is that. Let's enjoy this run. This could be a magical season for us. Why are we trying to divide ourselves you you made a comparison to the republican party earlier that's what it feels like it feels like the republican party hey i thought we're on the same side why are we fighting <laughs> yeah. it's 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 outrageous and i just want everybody out there to know my position on des is this he's not a cancer he's not to it's just the guy needs to work a little bit on his professionalism and and i have all the confidence in the world that you know it's going to get a lot better before it gets worse and you know, I'm rooting for the Cowboys to go to the Super Bowl here, and I think everybody else should be. Yeah. Okay, so I believe after our rants, we got one more story that we wanted to get to. Yes, the Josh Brown, the kicker for the Giants. Josh Brown slash Roger Goodell. Goodell. Yes. Okay, your thoughts? Well, I think that the jo Josh Brown is just kind of, he's there. It's, it's Roger Goodell and his continued failure to handle this stuff. I mean... You know, say what you will about Ray Rice. And by stuff, you mean player discipline. Correct. So, you know, you have the Ray Rice incident. You have the Greg Hardy incident. And you turn around and tell us, as Roger Goodell, we are putting women in power in this. We are coming up with a system that will punish these offenders. We are not going to let these issues happen again. Bam, issue happens again. He's playing. He only gets put on the exact week, what, four weeks in? Yeah. And, and what's going on with that? I mean, I heard there was reports that, you know, he was being aggressive at the very least with his wife and this wasn't looked into. The Giants knew about this and not only just kept him on the field, but re-signed him to a new deal. Yeah, I mean. And, and here's the thing that, that bothers me. I, I'm, I'm not the type that's too far to one way, but when you make a statement and you make a rule, you should be consistent with it. And when you say domestic violence will not be tolerated, and anybody who has their first offense will automatically have to serve a six-game suspension. I don't understand why Josh Brown was exempt from yeah. that rule. Yeah. And to me, that makes Roger Goodell inept at his job. And I think it's 110% fair to, to question him as the commissioner of the NFL, or at least when it comes to player punishments. Yeah, I think that this is a big issue. And it, it's a big issue not because of just Josh Brown, but is how many more slip ups how many more things are going to fall to the crack after you say that you're going to fix this you know and at this point i think that people are forgiving ray rice more than they've forgiven roger goodell yeah i mean he's he, i can't see him being the commissioner after whatever labor negotiations they'll final they're finished going to finish up um he's done a good job on one side but when you decide that you're going to be this guy who punishes these players, you need to understand you're going to get pushback because not everybody believes what you believe and not everybody sees things the same way. And you're dealing with facts and opinions and emotions. And when you sit there and say, OK, we screwed up, we're going to fix it six games. And then you turn around and say, oh, the Giants, uh, I, we didn't know. And it's a lie. Yeah. I mean, and again, it just kind of brings you back down to that harsh reality that the NFL is a business and a business first. They can try to pretend that they care. Yeah. But they're a business. That's true. 
Well, on that note, that sad note, I guess we'll, <laughs> we'll call it a wrap. That was our week eight Say What You Like NFL podcast. We look forward to bringing you the week nine NFL podcast at the same time next week. Again, leave a comment, leave a like. If there's something that you want to hear or a subject or a topic that you would like to be discussed on the show, leave it there. We'll try our best to get to it. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're known – Cowboy and 49er fans, so you'll hear some of that. That doesn't mean we won't talk Steelers, Browns, Vikings, all kinds of different teams. You know, we want to hear feedback. We want to hear about things you guys want to talk about. We may even go outside of football. You know, yeah, there's I mean, World NBA Series. season starting today, the World Series. Yep. So whatever you guys want to talk about, whatever you guys want to hear us talk about, please leave a comment, put a like. We appreciate it. So until next time, signing off, this is Philip Enriquez. And this is Eric Hernandez. See you next week.